Creek Church, I want to introduce you to my good friend, Dave Mackert, and he has an amazing story that I've asked him to share with our church this weekend. Dave, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name's David Mackert. My wife, Sue, and I moved to uh, Everett in July of 2012 when I took a job in the engineering department at Boeing. Uh, shortly after, we found Canyon Creek and have been coming faithfully since, and we love it here. And what are some areas that you serve in at the church? Uh, I've helped start the Celebrate Recovery. I'm uh, on the media team. I uh, serve on Saturday night and then wherever I'm needed on Sundays. About a year ago, when you and I just met together in my office, and you shared uh, what I think is one of the most unique background stories that in my 25 years of ministry that I have ever heard. Uh, I was born and raised in a polygamous family. My dad had uh, four wives all at the same time, and I'm one of 31 children. Uh, so you have 31 brothers and sisters? Yes, 13 brothers, 14 sons. So if you're in a family with four wives, did you know each one of them? Were, did you, were they all four of them your mom? Absolutely. We, we called them Mother Myra, Mother Donna, Mother Mitch. Your own mother was the only one that was mother. Like growing up, did you have like multiple houses or like one 25 bedroom house? Well, we had both. Uh, initially, each mom had their own house. And during my uh, ninth grade year, dad moved all of the family together in one large home. Uh, it was a triplex and we remodeled it into uh, a, home, a home for a polygamous family. And the basement was r really unique. Each child had their own bedroom. And the boys were on one end and the girls were on the other and there were rec rooms in between and, and it, was, it was quite the setup. So obviously now you, you look back at that and think, man, I had a wacky dysfunctional upbringing. When did you all of a sudden realize that uh, it wasn't normal? Well, normal's real relevant because to me, normal was having more than one mother because that's what I grew up with. When I, but I realized that there was a lot of dysfunction in it when I left, uh, which happened shortly after my first marriage. Uh, and I was probably 27, 28 years old. And, and my wife and I left together with, a young, with two young children. Uh, when a man grows up and he serves a two year work mission, gives two years of his life to the group. And then after that, he gets his own home and, uh, and gets ready, and then the prophet gives him a wife. So the marriages were actually arranged. So you had, your first marriage was arranged? Yes, I was told who to marry. You were told who to marry? Yes. So what was school like? We, I was one of the last of my father's children that attended public school. After I graduated, uh, and it became kind of the norm in the polygamous group, they started homeschooling. And so they taught their children at home. But, but school was really crazy. Uh, we had a much stricter dress code. We were, we were supposed to be covered from our ankles to our wrists. And uh, so when we walked out the door, being the rebellious child that I was, the sleeves got rolled up. To this day, I won't wear long sleeve shirts because it's my form of rebellion against that and breaking loose from I hate long sleeve shirts. So was, it, was going to school weird? Yeah. I mean, because obviously other uh, traditional families thought you guys were crazy, right? Yeah. We were taught how to lie, though. I mean, we, we were actually schooled in how to answer those types of questions. Uh, we were asked if you were polygamous. I'm say, hey, I'm 14 years old. I'm not even married. How can I be a polygamist? Well, is your dad? Well, go ask him. <laughs> it was an avoidance, but it was, it was lying. We, we moved, Dad moved his family together at the same time another prominent polygamous family moved into the same school. And I had kids actually come to me and say, we know who you are. You're one of the Jeff's kids. I said, no, we're the Macker kids. We live in the brown house in Sandy. The Jeff's kids live in the white house up in Granite. <laughs> so it was crazy. So when you say the Jeff's kids, you mean like the famous Jeffs that we've read about on the news, Warren Jeffs? Yes, I went to high school with him. You went to high school with Warren Jeffs? Yes. I think, didn't you tell me one time that wasn't one of his sister wives one of your sisters? Two of his sisters married two of my brothers. Two of his sisters married two of your brothers? Yes. Wow. Okay, so you grow up in this, you think this is normal. Okay, you, the prophet gives you your first wife. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you guys have a couple kids, and then you move away. Tell us what happened next. Well, we were so naive. We had absolutely no idea what the real world was like, and uh, and we stepped out there without really any moral compass. And it wasn't long before we found the joys of drinking and drugs. And uh, that's when my life took a spin for the worse. Went downhill really quick. Uh, after almost, uh, not even a year of that type of lifestyle, I found myself homeless with my two children in my arms knocking on my mother's door asking for help while my soon-to-be ex-wife was chasing around as an escort. Wow. And how long ago was that? Oh, man, now. <laughs> 1984. Wow. So then what happened next? Well, I, I found myself at what I thought was rock bottom and, and uh, ended up going to my first AA meeting and, uh, and ended up sobering up. And uh, from there I met uh, my second wife in sobriety. Peggy had uh, five boys from a previous marriage. She also came from a polygamous background. She was a plural wife. And so we had a lot in common. And uh, Peggy and I joined the Mormon church and uh, were actually sealed in, in the Mormon temple. We had one child together, which was Timmy. And uh, life was pretty good for a while. So. so if I'm adding this up right now, we're up to eight kids? Yes. Between the two of you? OK. You said life was good for a while. What happened next? Well, uh, the worst thing that could ha happen to parents, well, Peggy and I were in the middle of a divorce. Uh, our oldest son committed suicide. Uh, Brian was a stepson, but he was, he was my son. He, uh, he called me Pops, and I'd helped raise this kid from the time he was like 10 or 11 years old. And it was a real shock to the family, and it, it, it really hit us hard. Uh, and, you know, we were devastated by it. When he passed away, you guys were in the middle of getting divorced. Mm -hmm. How come, what happened with that marriage? Uh, just the dysfunction of, of our lives together and trying to, to work a blended family. And it's funny because last week you mentioned that how people sometimes go into a marriage saying, uh, well, there's always divorce. That was us. We, we went in this saying, if it doesn't work, we can always get divorced. And we did. So how did your upbringing, growing up, and the model that you saw was plural marriage, how, was, how were you able to overcome that? I wasn't. I was completely uh, unprepared for what real life was, was like. Uh, my social skills were very low and very backwards. Okay. Uh, I didn't know how to be a dad. Uh, the, the model that I saw was, was very uh, abusive. And uh, I actually tried to model my parenting skills by doing everything opposite that my father did. Wow. So at this point in time, you're how old now? After when your son passed away? About 30 years old. So you're 30 years old. So in your first 30 years of life, you grew up 30 brothers and sisters, uh, four moms, and drug addiction, alcohol addiction, and two broken marriages, and you had the horror of seeing one of your sons pass away. So at 30 years old, you've lived a harder life than just about everybody that's watching this video to begin with. Um, when did stuff change for you? Well, actually, it, it started changing at Brian's funeral. Uh, what happened was a, a friend of the family came back into our lives to be with us during our time of grief, and Valerie, uh, had found Christ and Valerie was going to a Christian church uh, and Valerie invited us to go to church with her and and I accepted I was the only one in the family who accepted and I went to this Christian church for the first time and uh, I felt love I felt acceptance I it gave me some hope at, at that point in my life Brandon I was hopeless yeah I, I had absolutely no hope no reason to really even go on and uh, and I found hope in this Christian church. I was so naive, the pastor, I had never heard an altar call. Been a Mormon or a, or, a, or a polygamous kid all of my life. And when the pastor gave the altar call and he said, pray this prayer, I prayed it. And afterwards I felt tricked. But I respected the prayer that I prayed and I believed what I prayed. And so I made a commitment to keep coming back to this church to check out what Christianity was about. 
uh, all the time I was doing that, coming back to church, I, uh, I went to a, Christ to a uh, grief counselor to help deal with the grief of it. And they told me to watch out for uh, about four months after uh, the death that when it's safe, you will grieve the loss of your son. And sure enough, on uh, September 10th of 2001, I hit emotional bottom. I had an emotional breakdown. Uh, Peggy found me in the fetal position, uh, crying uncontrollably, covered with sweat. Uh, and she did the very best thing that could have happened. She called my sister, who was Mary, who was also a Christian. Mary came over and got me, and she prayed, took me to her house. She prayed with me, and she reassured me of God's love for me. And, uh, and then the next morning, she went off to work. And about 9.30, uh, she, I got a phone call from her, and she says, turn on the TV. It was 9-11. I watched the first trade tower was on fire. I watched as the second airplane flew into the second tower. And uh, I started multiplying the pain that I was feeling from the loss of my son by the thousands of families that were affected by this act of terror. And I dropped to my knees, and I surrendered my life to Christ. I told him I didn't want to go on any longer in this world without him being in control. But my way didn't work. And uh, I made a promise to God. I told him I would go wherever he wanted me to go and I would do whatever he wanted me to do. And, uh, and he's honored that prayer and that So request. on September 11, 2001, when this tragedy is happening in New York, you commit your life to Christ? Yes. Wow. That's, that's pretty amazing. And what happened, I mean, what happened next? I mean, with all this background, all this upbringing, now you have this newfound faith in Christ, this newfound hope, and now you get to start viewing life through redemption. And I know when Jesus comes in, he redeems everything, redeems our mind, our values, our heart, our life, everything. And so what happened next? Well, I'd been in recovery for a long time, so I so I'd had a pretty good handle on staying sober, but, but it was the rest of my life that was really a mess. Well, God, God honored that prayer that where I promised I would go wherever he wanted me to, to go. And in a miraculous way, he moved me to Anacortes, Washington, where uh, a church who had been praying for some men to be brought to him that had a heart for recovery. And I was one of those men, and we, we started to celebrate recovery in Anacortes. Wow. Uh, along with that, one of the first things I did was I called uh, a gal that I had dated in between my first and second marriage, uh, who is now my current wife. And uh, I called her because when we had dated, we stopped dating because we were unequally yoked. I was a Mormon, and she was a Christian, and we knew it wasn't going anywhere. So out of respect to that, I called her just to let her know that I had given my life to Christ. She started crying. She told me how she had worked with the singles group and how that every time she would teach on being unequally yoked, she would tell our story and she would pray for my salvation. Uh, from that, we carried on a phone relationship until one day we just realized that God wanted us to be together and we planned our wedding and, and got married. Wow, and how long ago was that? It was almost 12 years ago. So you've now been married with all of your background. How old are you now? I will be 60 in so, August. So you're 60. You've been married to Sue for the last 12 years. Yep. And in spite of everything that you kind of grew up with, I'm looking at you right now. you got a smile on your face. You seem like totally happy, totally content, and totally blessed. Would you say that's accurate? Absolutely. God has redeemed so many things in my life. Uh, the, the old me, I was a drunk and a drug addict, and today I'm, I've been clean and sober for almost 12 years. The old me was, was afraid. I was afraid to leave my family because of the path that I had. And uh, today I, I help lead to celebrate recovery. Uh, the old me was controlling and manipulative. Uh, the new, today, you know, with, with the grace of, of God and, and the ability, I have the ability to let go of the need to control my life and let Jesus be my higher power and Lord of my life. Uh, the old me was a failure as a husband. Today I have a loving wife that, that honors me and we will soon celebrate 12 years together. Yes, I married up. All right, I like it. I like it. <laughs>